All right, everybody, you ready? I'll try and give you an opportunity to sit down. All right, our wonderful officer over here. Thanks for coming up during the break, by the way. Have you ever seen this? This is for the benefit of everybody. Okay. How long have you been an officer? Okay, this man has been an officer for 17 years. How often have people given you a, uh, are you a patrol or at all? Or? Oh, okay. But were you ever? Okay, most people have to work their way up to that position, so I figured that. But how many people presented you with a passport? A few over your career. Just a few people over his career presented him with a passport. What did you do about it when they did that? Okay. Let's see. <laughs> All right. In your uh, in your passport, and the lighting is terrible for me up here. That's all right. I know it pretty much by heart. Nah. Well, okay, I probably should, but. <laughs> The very first paragraph in a passport is a commandment from the Secretary of State of the United States. Did you know that? Okay. Because of watching my videos or before? <laughs> That's what I thought too. All right. He knows now because he watches my videos. All right. It's a commandment from the Secretary of State. And says the Secretary of State of the United States of America hereby give me your glasses. I'm, st I'm stealing them. God, I'm getting old. Oh, that's much better though. Thank you. Hereby request all whom it may concern. That's the police officer stopping you. To permit the citizen or national of the United States named herein, the citizen or national of the United States named herein, to pass without delay or hindrance, and in the case of need, to give all lawful aid and protection. So what's he supposed to do? Allow you to pass without delay or hindrance. And if there's a case of need, say a young father's wife is in the back seat going into labor, his job is to offer all lawful aid and protection, which means turn his damn lights on, get in his car, and clear the road to the hospital. Okay? That's what they're supposed to do. And that's a commandment by the Secretary of State of the United States. Lawful aid and protection. Okay. The State Department puts out a book. This is not the whole book. This is the first 27 or 28 pages of the book. The reason I only printed that off is because it's over 100 pages thick and it wouldn't fit in my binder. And the first 27 pages is really all I need to educate a police officer with. Because here's what the book is called. It's the United States Department of State Consular Notification and Access. And this is the fifth edition, which was put out in September of 2018. And it says it's instructions for federal, state, and local law enforcement and other officials regarding foreign nationals in the United States and the rights of consular officials to assist them. What? 
go to Telegram channel, click on files at the top, and download it. Okay? You can download all 100 and some pages and print it off at your leisure. Okay? This manual is an education manual for police officers and law enforcement. And it says in here, the very first question a law enforcement officer is supposed to ask anyone, are you a U.S. citizen? Why? Because those are the only people in the United States that they have jurisdiction over. You don't have jurisdiction over a national, a state national. You don't have jurisdiction over a foreign man at all. Zero. The only one that has jurisdiction out over a foreigner here in this country traveling is the United States State Department. No one else. Not a judge, not a court, not a police officer or law enforcement of any kind has any jurisdiction over this man while he's here. The only one that has jurisdiction over him is the State Department who can ask for the assistance of the U.S. Marshals to put him in prison if he commits a crime. Okay? And then he has to be tried in a certain way as a foreign national under international law. Because we have treaties with other countries that need to be enforced. A police officer can't even stop him if he knows he's a foreign national. And the minute he says he is, the police officer needs to get in his car and leave. Or call the State Department for a consul. I found it interesting that when I was arraigned in Tarrant County, that that judge's first two questions, because by God, they know who David Strait is before I get there. Their first two questions are, were, are you a U.S. citizen, and would you like a consul? First two questions the judge asked me. Now, I don't think they asked anyone else in that room that they were arraigning that day those two questions, but they did me. And I answered, yes, I am not a U.S. citizen, and I do want to count consul. And they didn't want to deal with it, so they wrote the opposite answers on there and printed it off and handed it to me. Violating not only my rights, but my due process and the full faith and credit of the United States. They just destroyed it. Oh, you don't think I've done that? <laughs> Believe me, it's just a matter of time. You watch the end results. It's coming. Police visor cards, one to go on each visor, shows the police officers what a commercial vehicle looks like. What kind of car you drive? You see a Nissan Maxima on there? You see what I mean? Then what gave a police officer the authority to stop her Nissan Maxima? Presumption and assumption. Thank you for saying that. Ah, this is the key to everything. And my mentor, a 23-year federal prosecutor, taught me this. He says the only thing the government does is this. And he wrote that on a piece of paper sitting across the table from me. And he wrote it down. I said, what the hell do you mean by that? Railroading. He says, yeah. 
The only thing government does is railroading. And this is how they traffic the persons. The definition of railroading in the law is to lead someone down a narrow path or rail to a predetermined outlook or conclusion. To lead someone down a predetermined path or rail to a, pre to a predetermined outlook or conclusion. Presumption. Read canon law and you'll see it's all about presumption. That doesn't look good. How about that? Presumption. They presume you've committed a crime. That's it. What's your reasonable articulated suspicion? <laughs> right? As a police officer. They teach you RAS, right? Reasonable articulated suspicion that you've committed a crime. More Something more than a hunch. You have to have a reasonable articulated suspicion, which is something more than a hunch. Assumption. You assume their status, their standing, and their jurisdiction. You assume that you have the authority, the right to, to rule over them, that they're in the right area with the right jurisdiction, with the right standing, that they're a U.S. citizen. You assume they are supposed to have a driver's license, you, on and on and on, okay? We can go on forever. Presume, presumption or assumption, they get your tacit agreement. Tacit. They tack it right to your, you know what. They get your tacit agreement. What's a tacit agreement? It's consent. It could be. Tacit agreement. They got to get your consent, right? How do they do that? Trickery, most of the time. They don't think it is because they weren't taught that it was trickery. They were just taught how to get your tacit agreement. For instance, they show up at your house, and you don't want them coming in your house. So you open the door and you step out on the porch. And you talk to them. That's your tacit agreement. Or maybe you open it up and say, I'm, I don't have anything to fear. Come on in. See that my kids are well taken care of, that there's plenty of food, that there's clothing, there's beds for them to sleep in, that they're okay. And you just consented. If you do not have posted signage at the street then the entire corners of your house are your only property. And they can come right on because there was no notice given. My property is fully fenced. The corner posts are painted purple. It's damn important, especially in Texas. And it's posted. And there's fines posted if they should trespass. And the police officers won't come on my property. They've came there before, but they park in the neighbor's driveway and see if they can get our attention to come over to the fence. Sometimes I just wave. I don't have to talk to them. Go ahead. Of course it is. I live on a land patented piece of property, okay? 
Come on the king's castle and off with your head. What's the last one? Hearsay. Everything is hearsay. A crime is committed. Police officer shows up 20 minutes later and he interviews you. Was he a first-hand witness? No. And you know what happens when a, they, you're in a courtroom setting and they put a police officer up on the stand to testify and you say, Your Honor, was he there at the time of the crime? Was he a first-hand witness? The minute they d you say that, I've watched them dismiss the police and he, they don't get to testify. But most people don't bring that up. They never bring that up. So the police officer just testifies because the prosecution wants him to. And they act as a first-hand witness when they weren't. I mean, their job is to show up after it's all over with and draw the chalk outlines. Crime's already committed. They were never a first-hand witness. Everything, every word that comes out of his mouth is hearsay. He goes and investigates the neighbor. Yeah, I heard a shot. Well, where did it come from? What caliber was it? What gun fired it? Who? Where did, was it fired from? Where did, was it fired at? Two. All these things. They build a case. You know how they finally get to that case? See, a police officer, I used to be one. We know if we put somebody in the back of the car and haul them to the police station, put them in a little room, people want to talk, and most of the time they incriminate themselves. They just incriminate themselves, and they know that. That's why they do that crap. If they just shut up, you have the, first of all, in a crime, you have the right to remain silent. Zip your mouth shut. Don't incriminate yourself. That's the single biggest thing that people do to get themselves in trouble. Now, I'm not saying don't commit a, don't commit crime. Crime. What is a crime? Let's let's look at that first, right off the bat. What is a crime? A crime is an injury. I have to injure another person. That's a crime. Can't injure the state. How do you injure the state? What is the state? Let's look at this for a second. What is the state? Ah, wait a minute. It's literally a piece of paper in a file cabinet somewhere. That's all it is. So unless you broke into that file cabinet and tore up their corporate charter, you didn't injure the state. Because how do they spell state? Did they spell it like this? Or did they spell it like this? Or did they spell it like this? Do you know that makes a difference? Tell you about a court case of one up in New York State. I like to use this as an example. The people of the state of New York versus my client's name. That's how the case was titled. The people of the state of New York versus my clients. And there was a jury. Your Honor. Is the members of the jury a fair representation of the people of the state of New York? Well, yes, they are. Can the state of New York, the people of the state of New York, be both the, the plaintiff bringing the case and the jury? Case dismissed.
It was done. It was over with. Right there. How many people think of asking something like that? Handling something like that? There ain't an attorney on the face of the planet would have said those words would not have come out of their mouth. They don't think outside the box. What about state of Texas versus David Lester Strait? Who's the state of Texas? Well, first of all, by the time I'm done with it, it's a private for-profit corporation with a Dun & Bradstreet number acting and pretending to be government under the color law. And where the hell's the victim? How can they regulate me? How can they charge me with a misdemeanor aid crime of a fictitious license plate on a vehicle they don't own? See, if I would have altered, put on a different plate on a vehicle that they owned because they had the MCO and I had registered it, then I would be in trouble for that crime. But I don't have a contract with the state of Texas. I don't have a contract with the Department of Public Safety. I don't have a contract, and they don't have the superior title. They don't own it. So under the UCC code 9-109, it's household goods. And it's my private automobile. And they can't regulate the private. They can only regulate commerce, and they can't interfere in it in a person's private business. So pretty much I know that already is going to go away. I'm not worried about it. But they're going to try by using Bonnie and my time I'm spending on Bonnie to make me miss a deadline and they'll get me on some technicality. That's what they're trying to do. I don't know that that's going to happen if I can stay on top of it. But they're making it difficult. And they make it very difficult because they're not even telling me who's bringing the case against me. They're not telling me who the plaintiff is or who they're representing. Look up my name on Johnson County Records. Look it up. Pull up the document. Look at it. And show me who's coming against me. I don't even know who my enemy is. In my own damn case. Tell me how that's lawful. I've never seen that in 30 years. There's no court name at the top. There's no nothing versus David Lester Strait. There's a charge of misdemeanor A. A, stating the statute and nothing else except a sworn affidavit signed by somebody who, who I can't even read their signature. Yeah, go ahead. Get on your phone right now. Well, yeah, but this is going to be more fun. I can't just pick up the phone and call somebody who can handle it. That ain't going to be any fun. And I won't make any money that way. And I won't be able to expose it all for the fraud that it is. See, I've got to let them commit the crime of fraud. And that's what they're doing all along the way. And now I'm just exposing all that in my documents, thereby setting them up at the window, and these stupid idiots are falling into the trap. And they're going to hang themselves on the courthouse steps without even knowing it. <laughs> no. I'm much more tactical than that.
Subject matter jurisdiction. Turning a right into a privilege under color of law is a conspiracy against rights and a violation of 18 U.S.C. 241 and 242. Crimes of this nature are subject to fines and not more than 20 years of imprisonment or both, 18 U.S.C. 1341. It is a crime for a powerful corporation like a county to abuse the process and attempt to overpower the individual with swarms of officers and a huge war chest. This goes against antitrust laws. 15 U.S.C. Articles 1 through 7. The Sherman Antitrust Act and the Clayton Antitrust Act are in place to protect the individual from power tactics used by the state. Any attempt by the county or state to convert the claimant's property into a commercial asset for the benefit of municipal corporations without just compensation is a tort condemned by a court case called the City of Monterey versus Monty Dunes. The Supreme Court ruled that municipal corporations cannot exert any acts of ownership or control over property that is not owned by them. That's Palazzo Zola versus Rhode Island. That's a 2001 case. There is no expiration date on the taking clause for city's illegal enforcement of its codes on the man's private property and restricting the man's business, affirming both Lucas and South Carolina Coastal Council. That's a 1992 case. Code enforcement cannot restrict development of a man's private property unless they lawfully acquire the land first. Surveying with binoculars constitutes a takings. You know, I've already caught them flying a drone over my house. <laughs> yeah. Bonnie, when I'm talking to Bonnie on the phone, I run little tests. I say certain things and then see what their reaction is going to be. And they react. It's kind of fun. Notices this agency and all signatures. Fair warning, not as a threat. Pursuant to United States versus Lanier on Satori 95-1717. Hereby informs its agency or corporation staff and personnel that any violation of the claim as God-given rights will be enjoined in the lawsuit as a conspiracy against rights by action under color of law and that's 18 U.S.C. 241, a deprivation of rights under color of law. And 18 U.S.C. Section 242 is a conspiracy against rights, which is punishable by fines and imprisonment. Now I'm going to give you guys a little helpful hint. When you go to sue these guys, never sue it, sue under Title 18. Sue under Title 42 first. Because when you sue under Title 42, that's civil, and you can garner all kinds of evidence, and you can win a monetary fee for doing that, which gives you the money to then pursue Title 18. Because once they lose under civil, then you can pursue criminal if you want to hold them accountable. If you try criminal first, well, then they have the right to remain silent. And you lose that ability to gain evidence. Under civil, they have to turn over all discovery. You see the difference? This is why it takes so long sometimes. Wheels of justice turn slow. Now, Bonnie's judge, the Hiss Act, is how the retired judges can't get in trouble coming back on the bench. It protects their stipend. It protects their salary. If they merely utter the word retiring, then their stipend and their salary can't be taken. So they say retirement the minute they get in trouble. That's what they do. 
Their retirement money is between one hundred and fifty to two hundred thousand dollars a year on average. Yeah, and it works for all federal employees as well. Texas Transportation Code 502.003. Believe me, this won't be the code in your state, but this same thing that I'm going to read is in the code in your state. It just won't be a 502.003. Okay? Registration by political subdivision is prohibited. A political subdivision of this state may not require an owner of a motor vehicle to register the vehicle. What did I just say? <laughs> okay. A political subdivision of this state may not require an owner of a motor vehicle to register the vehicle or pay a motor vehicle registration fee, or number three, pay an occupation tax or license fee in connection with a motor vehicle. Now listen to this, here's the exception. She's not listening. She's listening to somebody else. Pay attention. By the way, I love this couple. They're from Florida. They drove all the way to Texas on their 30th wedding anniversary to have me marry them at a seminar. Oh. I may or may not have just embarrassed them. Okay, so here's the exception. This section does not affect the authority of a municipality to license and regulate the use of a motor vehicle for compensation Two, to impose a permit, fee, or street rental charges for the operation of a motor vehicle used to transport passengers for compensation. Charge a fee may not exceed 2% of the annual gross revenue from the vehicle. I didn't know that, but... This section does not impair the payment provisions of an agreement or franchise between a municipality and the owners or operators of a motor vehicle used to transport passengers for compensation. So, are you driving a taxi, a bus, an Uber, a Lyft? Okay, then you don't have to register your vehicle and they can't impose a fee thereof. I'm reading you right out of Texas Transportation Code, and I'm telling you every state says something similar in their own transportation codes. Exactly. You know why? Because we have not been standing up for a very, very, very long time, so they don't know any better. It's not the officer's fault. They're improperly trained. And that's the cause of action in federal court. Since I've been in Texas, we've filed over 300 TCO reports. The Texas Commission of, on Law Enforcement. 300 TCOs. Because they're, that's the agency responsible for training the officers in the state of Texas. And their officers are all improperly trained. Every single one of them. They're good people. I don't mind having them over for dinner. But they act sometimes like they shouldn't be on the job. This is a picture of the plate I had on my pickup. It says, non-commercial, private, permanent plate of the Republic of Texas. Yeah, oh, yeah. That's just a photocopy. The metal one doesn't fit in my book very well. 
Okay. No, they stole them. Sure. That's that's right. It doesn't matter though if you have the MCO, you can put any damn plate on it you want. It's yours. They don't have a title. They don't have a contract. They can only regulate commerce. The problem is the hassle, right? Okay. But the hassle is very, very profitable, by the way. Very profitable. Go ahead. Oh, that's even better because RVs can't be regulated at all. A recreational vehicle can't be regulated. Look at the U.S. Department of Transportation code under RVs. Mm -hmm. This is a MCO on one of my flatbed trailers. State doesn't hold title to this flatbed. I went to the dealership. I brought it, bought it brand new, and I talked the salesman out of the MCO. You know, when I hooked it up to the truck, and I was about ready to take off, the gal comes running out of the office, and she goes, "Hold on, hold on a minute. I I made up a temporary plate for you to put on the back." I go. I don't need that. Just wad it up and throw it in the round file. And that trailer still doesn't have a plate on it at all. It's under the, just look up the U.S. Department of Transportation code. This is my manufacturer certificate of origin on the Chevy Silverado pickup that I was driving. Tell me the state owns that. This is the superior title. It's on, this is a photocopy, but it's on bond paper. And you see the red number? That's the CUSIP. Who holds the bond to my truck? I do. All I got to do is say, prove that you hold the title and the bond to my truck. Yep, the real one's in my safe. <clears throat> What's that? Yeah, never sign the back of it either. 49 U.S.C. Section 13505, transportation furthering a primary business. In general, neither the secretary nor the board has jurisdiction over the transportation of property by a motor vehicle when the property is transported by a person engaged in a business other than the transportation business. Did you understand what I just said? I didn't think so, because that's a little... All right, I'm going to read it again. In general, neither the secretary <coughs> nor the board has jurisdiction over the transportation of property by a motor vehicle when, number one, the property is transported by a person engaged in a business other than transportation. Are you in the business of transportation? Whoops. You mean going, getting a pizza and out to the movies and going to see your doctor and heading home or going to work? Are you engaged in the business of transportation? Yes, you are. No, you are not. The transportation is when the scope of and furthers the primary business other than transportation of the person. 
That's very well written. If the federal government does not have jurisdiction, while the, neither does the state. Do you understand that? No. No. It's called the Supremacy Clause. The, go the federal government is supreme over the state. States aren't sovereign. Never have been. Only the people are sovereign. And the people never gave the government creative authority. That took me a while to learn. States are not sovereign. We allowed them sovereignty over specific things that are listed. There's only 19 things we allowed them sovereignty over and no more. And it's the and no more that's so important, guys. It is definitely the and no more that's the most important. Because we only agreed in our contract, our constitution, to pay for 19 things. Trust me. The federal government is supreme over the states. The state, our, our constitution is the floor. They can't rise above the floor. They can't do anything to regulate something contrary to it. Now, I am not saying they don't try. They constantly try. The people of the states are sovereign. Well, God, God only handed down sovereignty to his son, who handed it to us, the people. And we, the people of the state, did not give them the authority. That in which one creates, one controls. We never gave them creative ability. Yeah, the Texas Constitution is incredibly poorly written. It's a terrible document, the Texas Constitution. Tennessee's is great. It's much better. It's the best written Constitution there is. What's that? It is not the duty of the police to protect you. If it's not their duty to protect you, how can they take your gun? You have to have the ability to protect yourself because they have no duty to protect you. That's been ruled over by the Supreme Court so many times. In fact, the Supreme Court just heard a case, New York versus Bruin, B-R-U-E-N. And I'll tell you what, that's the nail in the coffin as far as I'm concerned, for any gun control laws. Read that case. It's beautiful. It just happened. David, we're going to wrap up in about 15 minutes, okay? Okay, thank you, honey. What, what's that? What about it? What about it? Life begins at conception. Except in the case of incest and rape. That's it. Just because you go out there and make a mistake with somebody else doesn't give you the right to murder. It gives you responsibility. 
period. Okay? For me, that's a absolute simple done deal right there. That that is it. They fight everything. Who cares? They, they you think the the elite, the deep state, the powers that be that want to rule the world? Do you think they care if we're fighting? They want us fighting. They finance both sides of every war. They want to pitch whites against blacks, against Mexicans, against Orientals. They want to divide us with the Republican and Democratic parties. Do away with the parties. Vote for the individual. Man, the damn Republican Party keeps calling me up, the GOP, man. I'm like at the top of their damn list. Ask them. It's like I'm on the president's president scale. It's like, why? I don't even like you guys. You do, they do everything. The parties do everything wrong. Man, do I have fun when they call me. Those guys get off that phone educated. It's who has the guns. <laughs> Let me tell you something. If you added up our entire military, all the, num the number of people in it, of every branch of service, and you added up all the police, both federal, state, FBI, I don't care, add them all up and come up with that number, I guarantee it's a lot less people than the ex-military with guns. <laughs> the difference is they keep us all divided. And I'll, t I'll tell you something else about that. Most of the police officers, half of them, and they prove this, when the city of Houston, Texas flooded, remember the big flood? From the hurricane? Yeah, that was just the cause. The big flood. Uh, I'll guarantee your police departments have two locker rooms. Every one of them in this country has two locker rooms. I've built police stations. And one of them has their duty uniforms. And the other locker room, which is locked up, and there's only one key and only one person has it. <clears throat> it's full of United Nations uniforms, blue helmets, blue uniforms. And when the big flood happened, the city of Houston unlocked that door and told their police officers to put on the blue uniforms. And you know what happened? 50% of the police officers quit that day. That means half of the police are on our side. And half the police are order takers. Just divide it down the middle. Same with our military, same with everything. Everything is about, about this. Everything. Build the Great Wall of China, good and evil. And you can write the name of every organization on earth in it. Any police, everything on it. What does the word police mean? Policy. They're policy enforcement. They're not law enforcement. They have no duty to protect. No duty to enforce law. Why? Because the Supreme Court's already ruled over and over again, rules, codes, statutes, and ordinances are not law. 
their corporate bylaws, their policy. They're for employees of the corporation to follow. They're non-positive or negative law. They're not law. Oh, absolutely. It's in multiple court cases. I've got a lot of it in this book. Yes. Look at the Clearfield Doctrine, Clearfield Trust Company, that case. It says since governments chose to incorporate themselves and they chose to use a fiat currency, that they are subject to acting as any other corporation. So what you have out there today is you got Burger King using McDonald's to arrest Taco Bell. I'm not kidding. That's the county DA's office using the police department to arrest you. <laughs> Nothing puts it more plain than that. The definition of a privateer, this is good. A privateer is someone in their private business or their private affairs. They're privateers doing private business. Is a vessel owned, equipped, and armed by one or more private individuals and duly commissioned by a belligerent power to go on cruises and make war upon the enemy usually by preying on his commerce. A private vessel commissioned by a nation by the issue of a letter of marquee to its original owner to carry on hostilities, though he was operating as a magistrate for the executive branch of government. Ah, here's the key. This is the reason I read this right here. Government is what? Hey, my racer man's falling down on the job here, brother. <laughs> the laws of nations. Our nations are formed under trust. Our government was formed under trust. It's the public charitable trust. It's ruled by the military with three distinct and separate civil branches of government. What are they? Oh, I hate it when you say the word executive. There went my pen. Doesn't matter what order you put them in for this demonstration. <laughs> the administrative, the judicial, and the legislative. Why do I say administrative? Because that's how this nation was founded. It turned into an executive branch when it incorporated. Corporations have executives. That's right, that's why the president Signs an executive order. If you're going to come out of her, O ye Babylon, then we have to operate government as the people through an administrator, not through an executor. There's a difference. Do you know how many presidents we had prior to George Washington? 14. This country started in 1607. It didn't start in 1776. We had a history already. See, history is written by the victor. It's what they want to teach you. It's what they want to tell you. See? So here's the problem in the United States. There is no 
judicial branch of government anymore. None. They all became magistrates. The minute they became magistrates, they went under the executive branch. And a magistrate is an administer of the executive powers. Those who create policy, rules, codes, statutes, ordinances. Legislative branch is we the people's branch of government. It was designed as a checks and balances system. We were supposed to elect, elect, not vote for. We were supposed to elect our state legislators in Congress. And the state legislators that we elect were supposed to pick two of them to be representatives from each state. And they were called the senators. We were never, as a people, ever, ever, ever supposed to elect senators. Because the senators are supposed to be the check and balances on Congress. What is a Congress? A group of baboons. We knew people that we elect, our founding fathers knew the people we elect would be influenced by money and power and greed. But people that are picked or appointed are supposed to follow the will of the people. Everything is about the will of the people. When we start a republic and start the Republic of Florida, what is Congress supposed to do? Listen to the will of the people and then find out a way to pay for the things the people will. That's Congress's only job is to find a way to pay for the things that the people will. They're supposed to listen to the will of the people. What is the Senate's job in a republic form of government? 